Hello and welcome back to my desync tutorial series. Today I'd like to do a deep dive on the shuffler behavior. So what a shuffler does is it allows for this anti-nomadic mining system by moving these auto miners around as appropriate. Now I'm looking at a miner head that just ran out of its last resource just a few seconds ago. And as you can tell, it's already beginning to go down. Its vitality counter is counting down, 96, 95, and I'm going to make that go much faster. Usually I have it going this slow just in case there's other stuff that might happen, but since I'm looking at it directly, I'm going to right click. That's going to clear the register, and it's going to say it's definitely time for it to go down. Now that will trigger it to show the down arrow which will soon summon a deconstructor robot. And while that's happening, the miner shuffler is still trying to do work for it. So you can see it is bringing over a brand new miner for a mine head that's no longer there. So let's see what happens. It places it down, which is kind of a weird behavior, but that's okay. And it establishes and wakes up a dormant mine head. Let's take a look. Let's follow its source arrow. So this mine head was dormant just a few seconds ago, but because the mine shuffler lost its previous mine head, it engaged in a communication protocol that found a nearby mine head that is dormant, woke it up, attached to it, and is now beginning the full process of waking it up. It just grabbed a miner from this previous cluster it's placed it and now arguably it doesn't have to move this one but this one was placed in the past and it's gone dormant so it's going to replace it now as the first few pieces of ore go or crystal get into the mine head you'll see that it begins communicating it activates the auto hauler network and bear in mind I've done nothing so far other than just voice over and mouse around and you'll see as it begins to construct an entire mining organization around this crystal chunk. I'm going to let it run for a little bit and then speed it up in post-processing so you can see that process in better than real time. And there you have it, a fully constructed auto miner network put together by a miner shuffler. In that entire process, it only really made one mistake, which was placing this auto miner here because there are no resources. And that was just due to some confusion as it was pushing this uh, dash R and R out of the way. On the whole though, I think it did pretty well. It also stopped consuming additional miners when it ran out of the ability to place them. So it has one in reserve. So really, for placing all of these miners, we only wasted two total. Let's take a look at some of the logic that makes that happen. This is the total behavior zoomed all the way out. And it's basically three separate chunks. We're going to first check to see whether we have a mine head. And that's done in this data type switch. And if not, we'll find one. If we have a minehead associated, 
then we're going to either be finding a un unused miner and acquiring it, or we're going to be taking that unused miner that we've acquired and finding a place for it in the network that we're beginning to establish. Let's first take a look at how it establishes communication with a new mine head. So I'm going to zoom in here a little bit and pull up the code. Now at the heart of this, we're looking for a mine head that is transmitting the value 10,010, which as we established in a previous video is a magic sentinel value that indicates a mine head without a shuffler attached to it. Now we're doing this in an unlock lock block for a couple reasons. The first of which is that this is going to necessarily loop over every single entity that is broadcasting whatever resource that we're looking at. And so outside of an unlock block, that'll take quite a while. The other reason is that I played a little bit fast and loose with uh, setting this P1 register. And while it's inside this unlock lock block, none of, that, uh, none of those changes will flicker outwardly. So this is a pretty standard loop signal match that's going to identify any, uh, and it doesn't have to be the closest, just anyone that's broadcasting. Now, we could have multiple um, minor shufflers that are all looking for a new head to attach to. And so this piece of code is a little bit difficult, but it's the, it's the disambiguator. So we know that P1 at this point in time contains a mine head that is looking. And so what we're going to do is in a loop, we're going to read its signal. And I apologize for this kind of ugly syntax here uh, with all the lines coming over here. But we're going to read its signal. We're going to do a switch on that signal. If we got no match, that means that it's not communicating correctly. That's probably indicating that it is shut down or deconstructed or in some other way stale. And so this is going to pop off here which is going to go all the way back to the top of execution and begin that search again. If it does respond with an entity, it's probably talking to someone. It might still be talking about resources, or it could be talking to us. And the way we check that is we see whether it is currently broadcasting our own identity as its signal. And if it is, then we know that it's chosen us and we can safely establish communication and proceed. Otherwise, someone else was chosen and therefore we have to start over again. So this is uh, a little bit difficult because it's an asynchronous uh, communication between two entities where timing isn't well regulated, but this tends to be robust enough. Now that we have a mine head attached, and that's where this branch is coming from up here from our zoomed in image, we know that P1 is a valid mine head and that it's a, still a valid entity. We're going to check to see whether we have a miner in our deployer. So we're going to turn off mining. We're going to check the second register of our deployer component. And if that contains an object, then we'll continue down this path. And if it doesn't, then we're going to go and find one. So this is a very standard loop signal match in an unlock lock block. So we're going to null out the value that we're going to put our final result in. We're going to loop signal match. So this P2 contains the resource that we're looking for. We're going to find something that is broadcasting a value greater than 10,800, which is one of our magic sentinel values, and select the nearest one of those that is broadcasting that. So in pseudocode, that's with unlock, loop signal match over BA. If A, or the signal, is greater than 10800, select nearest, and then we're going to set it to our deployer. Now again, as per the deconstruction video, I could just have a wait here, and then hope that that wait is long enough to pick up the building and not so long that I'm wasting time. But instead, matching on P4 with a building filter 
is a much faster way to do this. This also means that if multiple minor shufflers compete for the same building, as soon as one of them loses the competition, it's clear to move on to another building to try and harvest. So at the end of this loop, we should have either picked up an object and now we have it inside of our deployer, or we might have failed, we might have not found something, we might have lost a race, and we're gonna go back through there, back to the top, through, and we might still go through this a couple more times. Now, you've noticed that in each of these three branches, rather than fixating on which branch I should be in, right? this doesn't have anything that hard loops back from, let's say, here to here. The reason for that is that there's a lot of things that can interrupt this process, and so rather than holding on to a stale uh, attempt, a stale piece of information, I want it to give up and try a different path as quickly as possible. All right. Now the weirdest part about it, about this behavior, well, let's take a look at next. So this is how we actually determine whether where we're going to put a miner down. So we know that we have a valid mine head. We know that we have a miner in our deployer. And the first thing we're gonna do is move back to our mine head and just touch base like a toddler at the playground. And this is to make sure that when we start hunting for a mining location, we're already close to the mine head, and hopefully that means it will place it within our target chain. This becomes a while loop here. And what we're looking for in this entire loop is to be next to a resource and not moving. And th that together means that our minor behavior has found a location where we can start gathering resources from. So to do that, we have our while loop. We engage the minor behavior. That's gonna take control of moving the robot into a position that's interesting and useful. We're gonna get ourself. We're gonna get our closest resource block. And then we're going to see how far away we are from it. Now I've interleaved, I've moved this get location around a little bit so that the get location is in a, uh, a more opportune position compared to the getting distance. So that's why I'm taking the distance value here and then doing the comparison here. It reduces the chance, it doesn't eliminate, but it reduces the chance that as I'm moving past something, uh, I'll think I'll you know, be in a, a position where I'm next to the resource, then I move away from it and think that's the new position to land. This, this does fail, but uh, it usually fails by putting it pretty close to where we want it anyway, which isn't perfect, but it's good enough. So we've got our location once, we've gotten our location twice. If those two locations are the same, then we're going to turn off mining we're going to deploy, and we're going to do another one of these match loops to uh, wait until we've deployed correctly. And this jump label is establishing the loop here. I know that was a lot, but I hope you found it interesting. Again, a minor shuffler is the key component in my anti-nomad mining strategy. It, again, fulfills three purposes. One, it regulates how many mine heads are active at any given time. Two, it picks up unused auto miners. And three, it places them near resources and hopefully in the resource network that's being formed by those auto miners. I hope you found this interesting and please have a great day.